Gene synthesis refers to the construction of gene length DNA, typically 800 base pairs to 3KB in length at base level precision. All current protocols for gene synthesis begin with solid phase phosphoramidite chemistry. Individual A, T, C, and G nucleotides are biologically derived, but they are extensively derivatized using synthetic organic chemistry. These bases are assembled stepwise under non-aqueous conditions into single-stranded oligonucleotides. Though it is possible to buy an oligonucleotide synthesizer, in practice it is rarely done anymore. Commercial suppliers led by IDT and Operon provide oligonucleotide synthesis with next day delivery at five-fold lower prices than could be achieved with the instruments that one could purchase for in-house use. Additionally, the need for water-free conditions in these reactions requires extensive monitoring and continuous use to maintain a high-quality product. When you purchase oligonucleotides from these suppliers, you receive individual pure oligonucleotide samples in screw cap tubes or in 96 well plates. There is another product called multiplex oligonucleotide synthesis that is much newer in which oligos are provided as a complex mixture at much lower concentrations. Next generation gene synthesis methods are expected to build off this alternate format due to desirable scaling and pricing qualities. Regardless of the source of these oligos, they must be assembled using in vitro molecular biology operations into gene length DNAs. In gene synthesis facilities such as GeneArt, DNA 2.0, or Gen9, the procedures for fabricating larger DNAs have been standardized. When a user orders a DNA longer than could be synthesized in one round of standardized fabrication, the sequence is broken up into shorter DNAs called synthons. These synthons have a constant length and do not necessarily correspond to genetic boundaries. The synthons are individually cloned and sequence confirmed. Various assembly reactions like slick, sewing, or golden gate method, which we'll discuss later, can be used to assemble these synthons into larger sequences. Above this scale, in vitro or in vivo recombination methodologies can be used to fabricate DNAs on the genome scale or theoretically longer scales. However, there is only one commercial vendor of these services as of 2014, SGI DNA. Thus, there are three distinct products on the market today. IDT leads in volume for single sequence oligonucleotide synthesis. The delivery time is 24 hours and the oligos typically cost 10 cents per base when ordered on the smallest scale, which is 10 nanomoles of material. The material supplied is chemically pure and in, in, in the sense that it contains no salts or other reagents, it is just DNA. However, the material is not clonal. Though greater than 90% of the molecules present in these samples are precisely the ordered sequence, these molecules will be contaminated with sequences containing occasional point mutations, deletions, or 5' truncations. Multiplex oligonucleotide synthesis takes longer to order, around two weeks. It costs around $1,000 for 5,000 to 55,000 oligos, but the pricing is highly variable and requires negotiation. As of 2014, this is still an experimental product and most commerce is business to business rather than to end users. Only femtomoles of material are present in these products, but just like with single sequence oligos, they are chemically pure and non-clonal. Additionally, the sequences are mixed together in a single tube. Gene synthesis has many suppliers. For full service gene synthesis, the per base cost is in practice around 40 cents per base up to 3 KB. The material is cloned into a plasmid and is thus both chemically pure and clonal when received. It minimally takes around two weeks to order this product, but synthesis difficulties are commonplace and orders can take many months. Most recent offerings include Gen9 and IDT's G-Blocks, which provide non-clonal products supplied as linear fragments with a faster turnaround time. Regardless of the downstream processing steps and the final format, gene synthesis begins with phosphoramidite chemistry. Companies such as Glenn Research sell controlled pore glass or CPG columns covalently attached to a single DNA base via the 3' hydroxyl. Solid phase oligonucleotide synthesis begins with one of these columns chosen based on the desired 3' end of the oligo being synthesized. These bases are protected on the 5' end with a trital group, and several positions on the nucleo base are similarly blocked to avoid side reactions. These bases initiate the formation of the oligonucleotide through cycles of reactions. In the deblocking step, the column is treated with a strong acid to remove the trital group. 
The column is then washed with the next phosphoramidite that will be joined to the growing chain along with a catalyst. This coupling step creates the bond between the backbone phosphate and the 5' hydroxyl. Note that there are only three oxygens on this phosphorus atom. It is in a different oxidation state than the phosphate in the desired DNA. In the next step of the cycle, the phosphate is oxidized with iodine to generate the phosphate. Finally, the column is capped with acetic anhydride to terminate any change that did not receive the added base. At the end of the synthesis, the oligonucleotides are full length but are immobilized on the column and contain multiple protecting groups. These linkages are broken by treatment with methylamine and ammonium hydroxide. Upon purification, a structurally normal synthetic DNA is obtained. Oligosynthesis instruments have been around since the 1970s and look like this. The various reagents for deblocking, coupling, oxidizing, and capping are housed in bottles under a nitrogen atmosphere and carried into the instrument by tubes. The A, T, C, and G bases have their own special positions on the instrument and are supplied in small vials sufficient for the fabrication of multiple oligonucleotides. Typically, an oligosynthesis instrument will contain additional positions for addition of chemical modifications such as biotinylated bases, 5' phosphates, or user-prepared phosphoramidites, including unnatural nucleotides. Finally, there is a position to install the controlled poured glass columns where the synthesis will occur. Beyond this, an oligonucleotide synthesis machine is simply a bunch of tubes connected to valves and a computer that opens and closes those valves. As of 2014, you will still find instruments like these in labs that work with unnatural bases. However, these are no longer used for production of conventional oligonucleotides. In a high volume commercial supplier such as IDT, oligos are synthesized at much higher scale on more advanced instruments. Shown here is one that produces 96 oligonucleotides at a time. Once oligonucleotides are obtained, they must be assembled into synthons. The simplest of these methodologies is ligase chain assembly. Here, both strands of the input sequence are synthesized completely in such a way that they can all anneal to one another into the full length target sequence. Typically, these sequences will be 50 base pairs in length but could be as low as 30 base pairs and in some variations are as long as 200 base pairs. Procedurally, the oligos are first treated with polynucleotide kinase to add 5' phosphates and then are subjected to a ligase chain reaction with TAC ligase. Through cycling of the reaction through iterations of denaturation, annealing, and ligation at elevated temperatures, the individual nicks between the junctions of the oligos are sealed, resulting in the full-length synthon as a contiguous double-stranded product. The other common way of assembling oligonucleotides into gene-length DNAs is polymerase chain assembly, or PCA. Like with LCA, the target sequence is synthesized as a pool of shorter oligonucleotide sequences that can be assembled into the full-length sequence in a one-pot reaction. The difference is that 1. The assembly reaction involves a thermostable polymerase rather than a ligase, and 2. There can be gaps in the sequence that will be filled in by the polymerase during assembly. Typically PCA is done in two stages. First, the equimolar mix of oligos is reacted with a polymerase under PCR-like conditions. Second, the material for the first reaction is used as the template for a conventional PCR reaction involving two external primers. Regardless of whether the double-stranded DNA is assembled using LCA, PCA, or a mixture of the two, the full-length product is typically cloned into a vector, introduced into cells, and individual clones or sequence confirmed. Reducing the cost and increasing the reliability and scalability of the gene synthesis pipeline is an area of extensive industrial research today. One of the most promising variants involves oligos derived from multiplex synthesis. Here many oligonucleotides are synthesized in a pool, and the mixture is sufficient to produce more than 25 genes. In some embodiments, the number of genes assembled from one pool is in the hundreds or even thousands. Because there is, little, is less separation of the reactions into parallel assemblies, and less phosphoramidite is employed due to the lower, lower amounts of material present, these procedures will ultimately result in a 20-fold reduction in price relative to CPG oligos. As of 2014, one commercial supplier, Gen9, is supplying DNAs fabricated in this manner, but several others are expected to begin production soon. 
Despite the alternate sourcing of the oligos, the molecular biology procedures for assembling the oligos into larger DNA still involve PCA or LCA-like reactions. However, there are several complications that need to be worked out for this to be commonplace. First, the quality of the oligos is sometimes lower than that of single oligosynthesis. This is primarily the result of omitting the capping step, but efforts are underway to improve this and it is expected that these syntheses will ultimately be superior to CPG-based syntheses. Because of the lower concentration of the oligos, these methods require elaborate amplification steps that also deal with the higher complexity of the oligo pool. There are various approaches to remedying the issues including error correction protocols such that involve mutation detecting enzymes like MUTE-S, the biasing of the design of the oligos to be more amenable to this type of assembly, and elaborate pre-amplification protocols and emulsion methods to deal with the complexity of the reaction. Today it is still the case that gene synthesis is used somewhat sparingly alongside more conventional fabrication methods. Its main drawback is that it's slow, and it's also expensive. At the current price it is impractical for even commercial users to not reuse previously synthesized genes. When I teach my BioE140L course at Berkeley, around two students each produce around three parts. In a typical year, this amounts to around 40,000 bases, which for the basic parts alone would cost around $20,000, which is already more expensive than we could realistically do for coursework. If all the composite parts that got generated during a project were synthesized de novo without reuse, the cost would begin pushing $1 million. Thus, this methodology has a long way to go before other methods of fabrication can be fully eliminated from the design-build test cycle. However, combined with automated assembly methods that enable reuse of synthetic sequence, the price point for these procedures is already making non-automated DNA fabrication a thing of the past.